Hi, this is Scott from Spectre Gear, and once again it's Wednesday, and of course that means it's Wheelgun Wednesday, and of course that means it's time for another Tactical Revolver video. Uh, for today's video, this is a follow-up to the uh, Live Fire demo video I did on speed loading revolvers. What we're going to do today is I'm going to go through the three different or, or three distinct steps of speed loading revolver, kind of break down each of the steps, and talk about why things are done in a certain way and then talk about a couple of things you might want to avoid. Uh, before I begin, let me first mention that uh, for today, I'm using inert dummy practice ammunition. This is a brass case. This is a lead bullet. It has the same weight and feel and characteristics of a live piece of ammunition, but it is lacking a primer, and there is no powder inside. I purchased these from Brownells. Uh, however, if you reload or know someone that does, you could easily have some made up yourself uh, just by simply taking a case. Go ahead and... Uh, Put in and crimp a bullet, but no powder and no primer. And of course, we're taking the additional precaution and drilled a hole through this. These uh, these rounds, and you can kind of tell by how beat up that the nose of that thing is. Uh, I used these for many years while I was teaching at the academy and uh, teaching for the department uh, out on the range. So these have seen these have seen uh, quite quite a few evolutions as far as reloads. Um, but I'm going to be using one that's a little better constructed for today. So, um, without further ado, let's go ahead and launch into this. Uh, I'm only going to be discussing uh, the main and primary reloading technique that I use for pretty much everything. And uh, I'll show it to you with two different types of guns. Here we have a, a medium frame, K frame. It's a Smith & Wesson Model 66 357 Magnum. And, of course, I've got a little J frame snub nose, five shot 38. Uh, so I'll show you the two different types of guns. It's really only one little modification of the technique that you're going to need to do to accommodate the smaller gun. But I've kind of, I've been back and forth on, uh, there is an, another technique that I showed in the last video, but I want to focus mainly on, on this one main technique because, in my estimation, I think that's the best overall approach to speed loading. Uh, so, um, We'll go ahead and start out with talking about the very first step. And the first step in any kind of a speed load is, of course, you need to get the empty casings that are in the cylinder out of the cylinder so you can get some new fresh ammunition in there. Now, uh, this, of course, always starts by opening the cylinder. But how you open the cylinder and where you place your fingers and, and how you set the gun in your hand is going to be critical towards setting you up for either a good or a bad speed loading experience. So, of course, we're going to, uh, having fired all the rounds in, in the gun or making the decision to fully reload the, the gun, we're going to press the cylinder release forward, or in the case of a Colt, pull it back, or with a, with a Ruger, Ruger, press it in, or with a Dan Wesson, pull it down in the front. But however you open the cylinder, we're going to do so. And as we do, we're going to take our index finger and contact the cylinder right about there. So we're going to press that through. And notice I went all the way to the rear. So that index finger comes all the way to the rear of the cylinder and against what's called the recoil shield. Uh, this, is, this opening is called the window. That's what the cylinder uh, resides in. But we're going to press that out of the window and press the cylinder fully open, wedging our index finger of our non-firing hand right there at the back of the cylinder. My ring, uh, or rather my, in, uh, my middle finger and my ring finger, are going to go to the rear of the weapon near the, the hammer or the hump on the back. My thumb is going to lock down onto the side of the cylinder. At this point, I'm going to invert the muzzle up. Now, you'll note, having my hand positioned this way towards the rear of the gun leaves this completely open, forward of the yoke. So I'm going to get a full, unobstructed press on that ejector rod. Okay, And that's not how we're doing the reload, by the way. I just want to illustrate that. So we pop open. We invert the muzzle, or pointing straight up, and we're going to take our the palm of our hand and we're going to do what we used to call spanking the baby. We're going to bring the palm of our hand right down onto the ejector rod and all the way down. So, just like so. You don't have to slap it so hard you put a hole in your hand, but when you've done it, there should be a little, little circle on there. So, down we go and up. At this point, all of the expended casing should have fallen from the cylinder. The next step is to simply point the muzzle down. So we're going to now point the invert and point the muzzle as straight to the ground as possible so that gravity can assist us in loading those uh, fresh rounds into the cylinder, making sure that they drop from the speed loader into the cylinder and rest in place where they should. Um, now, we're now ready for the next step, and that would be a lining up the speed loader and getting ready to release the rounds. 
Now, one thing I want to do before I move on to that next step is show you a couple of things that you should not do. And I want to go back to the very first reloading technique I was taught in the early 80s when I was in the Air Force and I was qualifying on the Smith & Wesson Model 1538 revolver. And what they showed us was to open the cylinder by taking your, your middle and ring finger and pressing the cylinder open and then keeping your fingers there and then inverting the muzzle up and then using your thumb to press the expended rounds out of the cylinder. Um, now what this is going to set you up to do is a couple of things that are not good. The first is the, the thumb technique is not terribly positive and what people have a tendency to do is those fired cases are going to expand slightly in the charge holes and that's going to create some drag and it, they're going to catch a little bit. So what people have a tendency to do is give them a push and then it, they hit that resistance then they back off and then they pump it again and again. So oftentimes you'll see people pumping three times. Now if you do this the wrong way it can set up a, a condition wherein you can actually catch a round of ammunition, get it to drop back into the cylinder and then get trapped so that the ejector rod is now trapped on the other side of the rim creating a circumstance where you can't close the cylinder, you can't continue loading the weapon, and you can't do anything until you hold that down and you drive that round out and then kind of pluck it out and get it out of the way. I have heard of this happening. I will fully admit I've never seen it happen one time on the range having seen thousands of people shoot. But that's not the main problem with what we're talking about by using this technique. If you open it up and use these two fingers and invert up, and even if you go ahead and get it with the, the one extraction, the one thing I want to point out to you is where my middle finger is right now. It's resting right up right up against that little odd looking thing coming off the back of the barrel. Well, that little thing is called a charging cone, or forcing cone rather. Um, now that forcing cone, uh, I'm sure if you've ever played with revolvers, you're familiar with this thing called a cylinder gap, which is a gap between the uh, back of the uh, forcing cone and the front of the cylinder. And that when you fire, sometimes you see flame come out of there. In fact, if you turn the gun over and you look at the top of the look at the top strap from the inside of the window, you'll actually see a groove on most revolvers that have been fired a bit, cut in the top. That's called flame cutting. Um, so it's cutting steel. With, with the flame that's coming out of that, that little gap there. Which, what that means is this area is what we call hot. And we're now gonna put our finger up against it and then rest the gun against the top of it. Now I've talked uh, before about seeing this actually happen on the range and, and it's, uh, it's bad when it does. Oftentimes it resorts in a gun being dropped on the ground. At the very least, you end up with a smiley face on, the, uh, on your middle finger and that's, that's no good either. So the whole idea of this technique that I'm showing you gets you away from that forcing cone altogether. So you take that finger, run it to the rear of the cylinder, open, wedge right there. You've got your thumb wrapped over the cylinder there. We are nowhere near the forcing cone at this point. Unobstructed, clear, palm strike onto the ejector rod, gets all of the cases out, and at that point all we're simply going to do is invert the muzzle downward. Now this may require a slight shift to your hand. Now, I talked earlier about how I had my, my fingers here and here at the rear, uh, or maybe I didn't. Um, I, I know I used to talk about that, but uh, relatively my, my middle and uh, ring finger fall to the rear at the hammer like this when I'm, when I'm executing this portion. But when I go to turn, I actually shift and bring those fingers down. So I'm still holding the cylinder open and keeping it in place and keeping it from turning or moving at all. And I'm doing so with my thumb. But the idea here is now the muzzle is pointed as straight to the ground as possible so that gravity can help us. And at this point, we're now going to get to the part where we put the ammunition into the gun. We get our speed loader out of our pouch, and whether we uh, are using a Safari Land Comp 2 or Comp 1, or whether we're using an HKS type loader, in all cases, you're going to grab that loader by the body. Particularly on the HKs or HKSs, which have this large knob, you don't want to handle and move this thing around by the knob. You want to do so by the body. The problem with doing it by the knob is, first off, it doesn't give you very good control over the speed loader. It also um, creates the opportunity that if you get this wrong, you can actually turn the knob enough to release the rounds before they're ever even aligned with the cylinder. So you want to do so by taking, uh, taking a hold of the speed loader by the body. And what we're going to do at this point is we're going to index two and two. We're not going to try to drop all six rounds in there at the same time. Instead, all we're going to focus on doing is 
getting two rounds lined up. I work the two round or two charge holes on the outside of the cylinder. I line up two rounds from the speed loader and just let the whole assembly drop into place. Now you notice I did a little a little jiggle there. When you get those first two rounds in, sometimes it'll drop right into place. Sometimes what'll happen is you'll catch and what'll what'll happen is the the casing, sometimes particularly on rounds that aren't crimped um, heavily, such as this round here, sometimes the, uh, the top edge of the casing will catch on the edge of the charge hole, which is a reason a lot of people chamfer uh, their charge holes to make the speed loading process a little faster. But you just get the two lined up, and then just you just sort of got to let it do its thing. Once the two are lined up, and you let go of that speed loader, just jiggle it a little, and all six rounds will fall into place. At this point, again, with the muzzle pointed straight down, we're going to hit our release on our speed loader, and we're going to let that speed loader fall away. It's no longer of any use to us. Now, if it falls into the palm of your hand like this, no problem whatsoever, because all we're going to do at this point is we're going to start going for that firing grip on the weapon, and we're going to start moving that cylinder in, and then our hand falls away and the speed loader will fall to the ground. You don't catch it, you don't put it in your pocket, you don't retain it. This is no longer of any use to you at this point. It's done its job. So you also notice that when I close the cylinder, I run my thumb up. Smith & Wesson's rotate clockwise, Colt's rotate counterclockwise. The purpose of this is if you're closing and you get, I'll set the situation up where you get between two of your cylinder notches here. The cylinder will still move a bit. I want it to be locked in place. I want the, um, I believe it's the, the hand or the pawl, or I guess pawl advances hand locks. Either way, there's a portion at the bottom of the, or there's a piece at the bottom of the frame that interfaces with the notches on the cylinder. You want to lock that into place. Now the cylinder is locked out. It's going to keep you from short stroking your cylinder or over uh, over stroking it. So at this point close, thumb goes up, locks into place, and you get your firing grip back on your revolver and you are ready to go for another one. So let me show you that with the Comp 2. Again, we open. Now they're simply going to fall out. There's nothing holding those bad boys in place. But we uh, invert, spank the baby, bring it back around so the muzzle's pointed straight down, we get our speed loader, we line up two, everything's locked into place. At this point, I'm not going to be turning a knob, I'm just going to be pressing the body. Speed loader falls away, thumb up and close. Literally that quick. So let me show you the same process, but with the J-frame revolver. There's only one little thing that I need to add in on this um, so that you're aware of it, but with the J-frame, same condition, thumb goes to the rear, hit that cylinder release, run that index finger, I said thumb earlier, I meant index finger. Um, index finger be between the cylinder and the recoil shield, thumb locked down onto the cylinder, invert the muzzle up. Note here, still, I can get full access to that ejector rod. Now do understand on the J-frames, the ejector rod is already too short for what it is. You don't want to do anything to diminish that, by the way. So you need to be really careful about making sure that your hand is all the way to the rear when you're doing this. So when you do these reloads, you really need to make sure your hand's out of the way. If it's up too high, and this has happened to me before, if it gets up too high, what's going to happen is you're going to invert. And you can see here now, this portion of my hand is now determining just how much I can get on that ejector rod because when I bring my other hand down, I'm slapping the top of my hand, not necessarily the ejector rod, and it's not doing a full stroke of the rod. You'll know that by feel if you've done it enough. You should feel pressure against the side of your finger, and that pressure should be that portion of the gun. That's part of training, and that's part of why you want to do the repetition so that you get it right. Get it all the way to the rear, spank the baby, Rotate it around, again, remembering to release those fingers and let the gun shift downward in your hand. If you slavishly lock these fingers in place, what will happen is you can't turn your wrist far enough. At some point, you've got to release and let the muzzle point downward. So here, uh, once again, we let, uh, we let gravity be our friend. Muzzle pointed down. Just like the other index or two, they drop into place. Turn, let it fall away. Same thing, come up and lock in place, and we're ready to continue. Let me get this out of the way. Let me show you that with the comp one. And then here, just like so, that fast. Now, as you're practicing these reloads, I want you to emphasize a couple of things. 
and they're going to be very important in particular for revolvers. Um, some things to watch for. When you're on the range and doing this, I don't care how perfect your technique is, from time to time you're going to get a straggler that's going to hang in the cylinder. So when you're moving from that step after you spank the baby, you're coming down, you're going for that speed loader. As I reach for my speed loader down at my waistline, I'm already looking at that cylinder. I'm looking at it for a couple of things. I want to know where these two holes are, but I want to make sure that there's five empty holes here, or in this case, six. If I happen to notice a piece of brass that's hanging, as I'm coming up with my speed loader, I'll turn the cylinder, and as I come up, I'll sweep that out of the way and then drop the, drop the speed loader in. It's a thing that's going to happen, so you might as well train for it. When it happens, don't look at it as a bad thing. Look at it as a good thing. But at that point, you are going to need to look at the gun to be able to do that. Uh, secondarily, not even secondarily, additionally, make sure that you go for the smooth is fast doctrine when you're practicing this stuff. At first, do it slow. And focus on making every movement as perfect and smooth as possible. Do not even try to apply any speed. When you're at the range, don't try to impress anyone, anyone with your speed loading abilities. You won't. Uh, you definitely won't if you haven't trained enough. I myself deliberately slow myself down. And the reason being is there's times I can make a speed loader. I can't make it look like Jerry Mikulik, but I can, I can make it look pretty damn good every now and again. But if I try to make it fast, I botch it every time. If instead I just make it happen and I don't really let, I don't make speed a concern. Rather, I just make executing and doing that execution as smoothly as possible. I make that my concern. They go fast all in, all in themselves. Uh, you, you don't, uh, again, applying speed in, in the absence of skill, all you're going to end up with is a, is a problem. Everything's going to, you're not going to get in everything to line up. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to start pushing it. You're going to start forcing it. And it's going to look bad. It's going to feel bad. It's going to be bad. Do everything nice and slow, nice and smooth. The speed will come all in, all in and of itself. Um, I think that's about it as far as talking about this particular subject. And I think that's kind of about it in, in regards to talking about speed loaders for a while. I think moving forward, I'm going to talk about some of the aspects of actually firing a revolver, some uh, useful modifications to make revolvers, some modifications you want to avoid on revolvers, a little bit about maintenance. But we'll continue going with the revolver um, subject. But I wanted to talk about reloading first because that's a thing that is everyone's overriding concern because admittedly um, I can I can anybody can speed load an auto loading pistol faster than they can a revolver that's the one thing that puts most people off aside from the the ammunition capacity the the speed and efficiency of the reloads um, are problematic for some enough to keep them away from the system altogether um, but I'm going to be talking beyond this about factors that may and reasons uh, for that matter uh, why the revolver is still an excellent choice for self-defense so uh, I think I'm going to be talking a, a bit about shooter induced malfunctions and some of the reliability issues and other things I've got a whole whole gamut of revolver topics to talk about so I'll continue pressing forward and try to do these each and every Wednesday moving forward so we have a little bit of content but for now I think I will call it so I want to thank everyone for watching and or listening again this is Scott from Spectre Gear and if you're interested in our tactical revolver project or products such as our speed loader pouches, please visit our website at spectregear.com. With that, I'll thank you and have a wonderful day.